You love to train, but you're constantly in pain and your current training isn't doing anything to help that. This month, Jared Slater, a former college baseball player, now strength and conditioning coach, joins the Move Pain-Free staff for a discussion about centering your training around proper movement. Let's get right into it. Welcome to the Movement Monday podcast brought to you by Move Pain-Free. I'm your host, Joe Comer. This is your haven for learning how your body is designed to move, taking deeper dives into slow motion film analysis, and simple exercises you can use to unlock your potential and move pain-free for a lifetime. So a concept that Joe and I talk a lot about in our training is the spinal engine and how we use our spine basically as the initiator of movement and our limbs are solely used to amplify that movement. And I know we've talked a little bit about that with you. Um, I just want to hear your views on the spinal engine as it pertains to your training system and as it pertains to baseball, your expertise. So, yeah. So I think that the spinal engine, again, it's a theory, but I think it's, I think it should be law. Like that's my way. Like that's just how we move. Like that's how our body moves, where the spine dictates and determines where our energy goes and the body's at the, let's say at the, is the arms and legs are at the will of the spine. Whatever the spine is going to do, that's what the body is going to do. And so with my training, I am now on the anti-core bracing community. So I think that core bracing is very stupid and dumb. But I will say that if you are a guy that likes to lift heavy and likes to squat heavy, you're going to have to. Like that's the one exception or else you can just destroy your spine. You're just going to be walking around and brace for the rest of your life. But you don't, if you're not throwing up crazy weight, don't brace your spine. So we don't, I don't do any power presses. I don't do any, you know, anti-rotation drills, none of that. All my core, core training or anti-rotation is done through rotation. So if you want to, if you want to base, I don't understand really anti-rotation, like you don't want your body to rotate, but basically with the spinal engine, if the spine has to move and it has to move like back and forth and it has to flow. And especially in baseball where the spine is really whipping the body around the body that your spine, there's a video on driveline baseball. I think it's Pete Bears throwing. I don't know who's throwing, but they did a perfect, like they captured the perfect footage of some guy's spine while he's throwing. And you just see how violently it's like ripping through. And if you're going to tell me that I need to brace my core to protect my spine, I think you're delusional because you, that if you really want to think about it like that, you're going to brace your core and that spine is just going to do this. It's just going to stop abruptly. It's not going to keep going. And so that's just going to cause a multitude of problems. But with my training, I do a lot of, you know, side bending stuff with tension, moving the core with tension. One of my favorite things to do is take a pair of J bands. So they're basically like uh, medical, like tubing. And there's like little um, cuffs on the end. And basically using that, and that's a really good example to teach the core how to move and move with tension. So doing a lot of bends, doing a lot of pulls, doing things that challenge the core not to stay rigid and stiff, but challenge the core to move with tension, to rotate with tension, to get into your oblique slings with tension, to basically feel, you know, everyone talks like ground force to feel the body from literally from your head to your toe, to feel tension throughout your body and then move with that tension. So a lot of my remote guys right now, we're in a big velocity phase. So my remote guys are like rotating as hard as they can right now. So my weight room stuff has to accommodate that. So since I know they're going to be rotating really, really hard, my weight room stuff has to be okay. Let's get their bodies back now to a good neutral position. So it's a lot of moving the core and now I know Mitch and I, we've talked about moving slow, moving fast, but this is where I think moving slow helps is to teach the body what it's like to move again correctly, because we have to go slow before we go fast. So then going through these core movement where you're still moving with tension, but doing that slowly is going to help reteach and like you say, recode the body into moving through the correct pattern after it's rotated super, super hard. So with spinal engine, I think that everyone needs to do it. I think it's, it's the way your body moves. And if you don't think it's the way your body moves, go watch some video because your eyes aren't working. Um, yeah. but like, seriously, like it's, it's just the way that we move and the spine has been treated for so long at this, as this super delicate thing that, you know, we can't touch. And 
oh, if you know, if you don't brace your core, you're going to throw your low back out or, you know, your spine, you're going to have spinal issues by doing this, by doing that. The spine moves you, your spine is constantly moving. So to say that we have to protect something that's constantly moving doesn't make sense. The spine's designed to move. It gets messed up when you throw all these other things at it and you try to make it stiff and rigid. It's not, obviously it's not, a, it's not really like a, a joint. It's not going to like move. It's not going to have circumduction. It's not going to abduct. It's not going to do all these things, but it's going to move back and forth. It's going to help the body to rotate. It causes rotation. It causes movement. So we need to basically lubricate it like a car. We have to, like, we have to make sure that it's ready to go. Like it's got to go and it's got to go fast. Yeah. Yeah. You said it all right. If I was going to stand up right now, what was the, what would be the first action I would make? If I'm going to stand up this way, I would turn my chest this way and then I would push myself up because your spine is the leader, right? And I think our training systems really align in, in this concept, right? And I really want to talk about the slow piece because that's where we, we groove this pattern, right? We can find the exact path that that spine needs to follow for specific tasks, right? If we're, if we're moving at a certain angle, the spine needs to follow a certain angle. And then if we want to change that angle, then we can groove that slowly and then start to speed it up. And we're going to learn, our body's going to learn from that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say like moving slow, like, like you and I are both not fans of performing movement slowly because movements perform fast, but you have to give them some place to start. Someone who can't move is not going to move fast correctly. And when you move fast, the body, the body defaults to its basic setting, to the pattern it's done so many times over. So in order to reset it, you, you do have to move slow. And like you said, teach the body, teach the spine the correct angle to move at. Yeah, and you'll see that a lot. So looking at like just strictly running patterns, you'll see this a lot. We'll have someone recoding, 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 and then they'll look good like in their walk and then their jog, they'll look good. And then, like you just said, when they start moving fast, they'll start to default back to that that pattern that's been ingrained in them so long. And then that's a, that's what we look at, right, in a movement assessment is their full speed movement because you can fake it slow and that's what we count on, right? You can fake it to learn, but then we look at the movement assessment and then we see what, what pieces they're still missing. And that's, that's the basis of training movement patterns, right? We just fix something. Okay. Look at it again, fix the next thing. And then eventually it's fully formed and they're brand new, perfect movers. Good to go. Good to um, go. Good to go with them. Um... With the spinal engine too, I think one thing that kind of gets overlooked with it is that people think it's some super advanced concept and it's something that you can only do with, you know, super advanced athletes whose training age is so high and, you know, you can't give them basic exercises. They have to do like, if you look at kind of progression or almost regression, the best movers are babies, like newborn babies, kids are perfect movers because one, the movement hasn't been destroyed from sitting in a desk and doing daily things that everyone does now. But that's like the perfect example of how a human is supposed to move. Look at a baby squat, look at them crawl, look at them do all these basic things. They are exceptional movers. And so I think with the spinal engine, we can kind of say, hey, look, it's not this advanced theory, it's how babies move. So kind of almost not dumbing it down, but trying to... Um, make it more accessible and make it easier for people to understand rather than, because if, when someone hears spinal engine theory, they think it's some big, huge, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to get five degrees to understand this. And I'm going to have to take all these certs and do all this other stuff when it's just this, it's just the spine, the spine drives movement. That's all it is. And so I think using the analogy of how babies de demonstrate sp the spinal engine is the best way to show people that, Hey, it's not some big overarching concept that you're not going to be able to understand. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the easiest way and Joe can actually probably break this down simpler because I always say things and then he makes them more digestible, but the spinal engine is just your chest points one way, then your hip points one way, and then your ankle points one way, and then your chest turns direction. 
and then everything else changes direction the same way. Your your chest leads because your chest is just a, an example of what your spine is doing, and it's right like you said, it's simple, but the 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 term spinal engine theory is it's scary. <laughs> Um, and we do a lot of that stuff. Like you were saying with the babies, Joe can kind of go through like our traveling drill series. Um, we do, we use a lot of developmental drills. Yeah. It's like, first and foremost, what does the baby do before it starts to crawl? It rocks a little bit and then it starts to crawl. And then when it starts to crawl is when you first see the spinal engine take place, right? You see, as Mitch said, chest points hit points in the case of the crawl since you know it's not on two legs it's it looks slightly different but that same principle is there so that's what we do is we get on the ground on all fours rock around a little bit sit in that position once you learn that start crawling some and then over time as it does for the baby the crawl translates into the walk when you go through that process it translates into your walk and so it's kind of taken that concept of when you're saying start slow, it starts with very simple, small movements, adding it into a traveling drill, like with a crawl, like the baby does, which will translate into the walk, which then over time starts to translate into higher speeds of movement. So it starts with very simple movements. It's like having a bunch of small habits that lead to big outcomes. That's what the goal at the end of the day really is. And that's really all the spinal engine is chest points one way knees point that way because the hip and the ankle are opening up with it. Then since this side's loaded up, it's accepted energy. Well, now I need to get to the other side of the body. So how am I going to do that? Well, my spine's going to start that my chest going to point the other direction. Everything's going to follow. Yeah. And that happens in locomotion and it happens in baseball as well. It happens in very lateral movements the amplitudes or the the angles of that that spinal rotation just change based on the task at hand, right? Our body's amazing at adapting, at compensating if you don't have the the space, the tension to do it, but the spine is what drives everything. So yeah, and I think you sent me a video on Twitter of some dude who's jacked out of his mind doing hill sprints. And you know, good for him for for doing hill sprints. But if you look at how he runs, yeah, he's running like the was it the policeman from Kai with the chance of meatballs, just so <laughs> stiff arms are moving. But what you can see there, I think that's a great example though, is you can see that the body wants to do it. He's still, you know, left leg, right arm, right leg, left arm. He's still running correctly, but he can be running so much more efficiently and moving so much more efficiently with the use of the spine. So it's not to say that, Oh, if you don't move the spine correctly, you, you just can't move. Well, it's not true. You just move really poorly. You still can move. The body is never going to move right arm, right leg, left arm, left leg. Like, you look so dumb. Like, just, I don't, like, yeah. you, you, you're just not going to do that. And so, like, with, with that video, like, spinal engine is there. Just some people are able to access it and use their spine to benefit them versus using it against them. And, like, when you look at bodybuilders, you look at power lifters, you look at people who train for a certain thing, and that certain thing is strength they tend to leave out the movement aspect. Now that's not to say that they have good mobility in the joints that they use because in order to lift a ton of weight and to not get hurt every time you do it, if you're lifting 800 plus pounds. You better have some pretty good mobility or else you're going to destroy your body. So it's not to say that they have poor mobility, but they neglect rotational movement and natural movement in order to achieve the goal of crazy strength. And so with these bigger dudes, I kind of have a question for you guys now. Do you think that if they did add more, you know, I don't want to say spinal engineering again, but if they added more, you know, correct movement and movement training or MPF training or training to move the body the way it should, do you think they could lift more or do you think that it would stay stagnant? I, uh, That's a good... Go ahead. I actually, I think you could lift more for two main reasons. One, I'm going to give the reason that kind of explains it too. I'm going to give more kind of a case study I've seen with a friend of mine. When you learn how to use your body properly and tension the body as a whole, you know, well, like, as you said, you didn't want to say spinal engine. So even if we're standing still, 
we use that concept pairing of like actions, right? If we're two legged, the spine's not moving. So this isn't going to, the legs aren't going to rotate if the spine's not rotating. But if we're one legged, it's rotating. That's the picture. When you take that concept of tensioning and you start to apply it to even just normal lifts, say a bench press, for example, I do think you will get stronger in those movements just because you're using your body more efficiently. Now, it kind of it changes depending on what the task at hand is. So, but I'll use my, a friend of mine, for example, um, he's kind of new or he's not new. He's been, uh, lifting for like a year. He's having knee problems, back problems. We've been giving him his stuff and he's been getting rid of that, but he saw a 35 pound increase in his bench press just from a simple cue of, we use a cue with the feet, for example, tear the ground apart. What that does is it properly tensions the foot and it starts to tension everything up the chain all the way. On the bench press, it's very common to just like fully extend the teeth. It's just crazy, like the amount of arch that you can get in some bench presses. And then they like to tuck the feet super far under them to where it's like they're not even getting any leg drive. So I said, stop that. Chill out with the spine, tear the ground apart with the feet and see what happens. And it was a 35 pound increase in like two weeks. And these aren't newbie gains because he's been working out for a while. And so, but what we're finding then in this particular guy is all these movements that he was doing that aren't really sports specific or anything that we do. He, you know, he's working out to look good. He's increasing those numbers and he's staying healthier because he's putting the body in a better position and tensioning it in a better way so that it can perform better, even at whatever he's doing. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah that, that's like, go ahead, Mitch. Yeah. And what I was going to add just to those ideas of people who train for powerlifting or even Olympic lifting, um, the nature of their sport is to tension one side of their body at a time and slack the other. So I like to talk about the deadlift, right? At the bottom of your deadlift, when you are, you haven't touched the weight yet, you're, you're about to grab it. The backside of your body is comp as long as it can be. You're tensioning that backside and that front side of your body is going to be slack. And then the goal is to reverse that, right? You want to compress the backside of your body, tension the front side of your body to get up to that, that locked out position. The nature of the deadlift is to have tension on one side, slack on the other. So it's it's a system of slack. And the nature of movement tasks, such as sprinting, swinging a bat, throwing a ball, uh, striking, uh, is to tension the full system so that we can exert force, but also accept it, transfer it, and then exert it again. And that's the piece that's missing with all of these people who use lifting based training. They, they don't even know how to full system tension. They, they lose it in their feet. They lose it in their hips. They, uh, they lose it in their upper spine, their mid spine, their lower spine, just from the nature of the, of the training, right? We're collapsing to the inside edge of our foot for optimal one side tension, but we're losing tension in the other side. They thrust their hips forward again for the same reason to perform the task, but lose the space in our joints, lose the full system tension, and in doing so, lose alignment of our skeleton. And it's the same thing in the upper back. The, we call it rib flare when basically you're just pushing your nipples up toward the sky. You're, you're extending your T-spine beyond its limits. So yeah, it's just the training is not aligned with the goals for a lot of people now with the power lifters the people who post their hill sprints running like this their training might be aligned with their goals but when you see them actually moving you can you can tell what they do for training yeah and like I, I talk about the, i talked about this a lot before but like your sport is only or your training is only one aspect of your life you still have to live the rest of your life you, you have a family maybe you don't have family, but you have a family you're a dad, you're a mom, you're a brother, you're a sister, you're, you have like, you're, you have your life and focusing on training to get a certain goal is super, super cool. And that's a goal and it's something that's a dream, something you should chase. 
but then you also have to, you know, okay, you're, you know, let's say you're like top 0.001% genetics, you're pulling, I uh, use the Delta example, you're pulling, you know, almost a thousand pounds off the ground and you're, you know, 35. Okay. You're still going to live twice that. So now you got to live the rest of your life but now you've trained for, you know, 20 plus years to lift that much weight, your body is so screwed up that those next 35, 40, 50 years of your life are going to suck because you're going to be in so much pain from not training movement, from training for strength, training for hypertrophy, training for power, for force, things that aren't going to matter when you're 35, 40, 50 years old. Like that stuff's not going to matter. What's going to matter is you know, can you play with your kids? Can you play with your grandkids? You know, are you going to be the dad that's like, oh, no, I can't go on a hike today because my back hurts or my knee hurts? Like, you're not going to want that. Like, sure, it's cool to do all these things now, but we have to think about the bigger picture. You know, we have to think about, you know, years down the road when, you know, okay, your bones are going to be weaker because you're getting older. Your tendons, your ligaments are going to be weaker. You have the movement in place to move correctly so you don't put added stress and extra stress on those joints. Because the joints are going to wear down as you get older. You know, your cartilage is going to wear down. Those those joints are rubbing, you know, for 50, 60 years. There's going to be some damage in there regardless of how well you move. But the better you move, the less you're going to have to deal with that and the less pain you're going to be in and the more things you can do. And so with these guys that have these one, this one goal, which is awesome that they can lift that much weight because that's insane. And I'm never going to be able to do that in my life. Like, absolutely insane. And that's not to shade them, but like, you know, at the rest of your life too, after like, you gotta, you gotta figure something out. Yeah. Who says this? Uh, it's Goggins, right? His, he's afraid of one thing, David Goggins. He's afraid that he's going to die and he's going to meet God and God's going to show him this whole life that he could have had if he would have worked a little harder, if he would have thought about the future. And yeah, this is the same concept, right? You're thinking about this, this goal set in front of you like to deadlift a thousand pounds. But what if you, what if you die and meet God and he, he says, Hey, uh, check it out. Check out all these hikes you could have gone on with your kids. Check out all these pickup basketball games you could have played in. Check out th this golf tournament you could have won when you were 80, if you could walk. Right. And now you're, you trained for this goal that wasn't aligned with, our, our body's base function, right? Because we actually talk about this a lot. Your body's base function is to move and then to lift things like one time and then move with them. Like if you go out on a hunt as a, as an early human, you're going to walk, run, sprint, kill an animal, pick it up once and then carry it back to camp, right? It's 99% yeah. movement and one percent lifting if that and yeah we we've lost our alignment with our base functions so yeah the last thing on this topic the perfect example of that is um uh, ronnie coleman like yeah. just perfect example of like probably the best genetics that will ever exist ever and nothing will ever come close because his natural physique looks better than everyone's like enhanced physique and it's not even close and you just look at like, dude, he squatted 800 for reps. Like, are you kidding me? As a bodybuilder with like, what, 6% body fat being that strong, that dried out is. And, but you, if you look at him now, like, dude, he can't, I think he's, I think he's walking like, okay now, but like, man, he like destroyed his body. Like yeah. destroyed his body. Think of all the years that takes off too. Oh not, yeah. Not only are we talking quality, like we're talking quantity. Oh yeah. Dude, you're destroying your, um, your DNA, like destroying because your body has to play catch up and has to, you know, trying to heal things that it like, it takes a lot of energy to heal. Like, it's not like, okay, the body is good at healing. It's going to heal now. Like it takes energy and it requires effort and the body's going to take time from other things to heal. And if it has to heal constantly, over years and years and years, it's going to eventually, like you said, it's going to take years off your life. And like, it's just. That's a, that's a really good point. What we see a lot with the people that were recoding is 
they come in and they're in pain. But another thing is they're low energy because their body's constantly healing, right? It's it's constantly being broken down and then their body's always in heal mode, um, which is good. The body's amazing. But if you start feeding your body actual natural movement patterns and it doesn't have to constantly say, oh, I'm broken down. I got to fix that up. Your brain's going to feel more awake you're gonna feel more alert because now your body isn't focused on repairing the the joints all the time your body's able to focus on other things and that it's it's just a huge snowball effect of become a better mover and everything in your life will ramp up you'll become more alert you'll feel better you won't have anxiety about hey am i gonna pull my hamstring today am i gonna throw my back out today it's it's just a matter of put in the time now to make sure that you can do it for 50 years from now. And exactly too. your body is always in a fight or flight response state. It's always like, it's always on edge. It's always fighting. And not only are you not going to recover, like your anxiety is going to be through the roof. Your blood pressure is going to be through the roof. Now we get into actual health problems, not like movement problems, but like legitimate serious health problems that can lead to, you know, horrible things down the road. And that's all from like just moving incorrectly. That's not even from, diet sleep like social mental that's just pure movement and it, it's if movement can do that that's crazy like that's just on a different level jared do you know your social handles off the top of your head you're on twitter right yeah i am uh i'm just on twitter so that's yeah. the only one i use um you can find me at i am underscore slater r so i am underscore slater r because someone took i am underscore slater and maybe cool. if I pay, for, maybe, maybe if I pay for a blue check, they might give me it, but. What a blue. Yeah. Cool. Well, it was really good talking to you. If you're listening to this podcast, go follow. I am underscore Slater R because he drops a lot of good knowledge and he's always retweeting our stuff too. Cause he's pretty cool. So <laughs> thank you again for coming on. Thanks for meeting up with me again, Joe. I know you get sick of me, man. <laughs> Nah, how could I? To start centering your training around natural movement, click the link in the description for a free three-day pain relief routine. And leave a comment, like this video, and subscribe to the channel for more information about how you can start making memories in life without the pain.